when you leave the vegan YouTube community, you treat it as this apostate. It's worse than when, when you leave a religion. This is your first time checking out my channel. My name is Tommy. On this channel, we talk about spirituality and mental health from an eating disorder recovery perspective. We do an awful lot of different vlogs, fitness, nutrition, and such much more. And this big guy here, Fudgy Boy. So today what I actually done was asked on Instagram, Facebook, and actually Twitter on my social media following pages to ask about a Q&A. So I've asked you your questions, what you want to hear from me. So the first question I actually have is from my dear friend, Joe Joyce. Big shout out to you, Joe, much love. She asks me, what do you see when you look in the mirror? That's a really, really good question, Joe, actually, because obviously with me of an eating disorder in the past, a lot of people have the perspective that all eating disorders are the same, but eating disorders are very multifaceted in the respect of what is different for one person will be very different for another. So for me, I did have a bit of a body image. I did see myself as being a little overweight, even though it wasn't that that drove my eating disorder. It was obviously grief that drove my eating disorder, but I did see myself, I always thought I was a bit more overweight and I over accentuated the problems with my body. I did have a bit of a concave chest, which is quite usual with eating disorder recovery because you've wasted away your muscles. So I always used to look at the bad parts of my body. Now, when I look in the mirror, I'm absolutely glad to say that I love when I see myself getting bigger. It's really, really positive because it lets me know that what I'm doing is actually pushing myself further in recovery. So I constantly see the good parts of my body now rather than focusing on the bad parts. And I think that's something that we all can relate to because we're very, very motive driven, we, we always see the beauty in certain things and we over the bad parts. So what I would always say is focus upon what's really good about you and realise that you're really special in every single way and you're unique and what works for one person doesn't work for another and just because you've, we've all got some sort of blemish doesn't make us a bad person and doesn't mean that we're any less of a person than another person. So thanks very much for that, Joe. I really, really appreciate that. It was a really, really good question. Like she actually said, she thought it was a little intrusive, but preparing answers. What is the first thing you notice, for example? Me, it's my eyes because I want to see my soul. For me, I always tend to look at my face. I don't know why it is. It's just something that I always think to myself, do I look a bit older? Obviously I am getting older, I'm 40, but I always look at the wrinkles and things like that, which I've got a few, but I'm, I would say that I'm not overly old looking for my age. A lot of people say I look like 30, which I'll take that, I'm 40. But yeah, that's what I always look at. I always look at my face. I, that's something I always focus on quite a bit. Don't know why exactly, but yeah, that's what I do. Really good question, Joe. The next one is from my dear friend Susan Anderson. Much love, Susan. I hope you're doing well and Happy New Year and I hope it brings much health and happiness. She says, my appetite has gone down dramatically. How do you cope with this and what do you make? Do you do to make sure that you don't lose weight? That's absolutely a great question, Susan, because obviously you've suffered with an eating disorder as well. So you know exactly where I'm coming from when, you, when I say that when you've actually suffered with an eating disorder, your hormones can be totally out of whack. So things like leptin and ghrelin and obviously neuropeptin YY, which are obviously the things that regulate your hunger and society cues, they can be totally off. Your stomach can be shrunk because obviously you just haven't eaten enough and through the years it's obviously got really, really bad and it hasn't obviously sent the signals to the brain to let you know that you actually need to eat. So what I actually do is I would recommend you eat by the clock and that's something they recommend quite a lot in eating disorder recovery, especially in inpatient and outpatient settings if you obviously have a therapist they always tell you to do that and the reason for that is because you don't actually have these satiety cues and the hunger cues so obviously when we're, when we're eating we don't get up we don't get full we obviously don't get the hunger cues so what you've actually got to do is you've got to beat by the clock so every two to three hours breaking it down to into micro meals and what I mean by that is small meals little and often that you can obviously get in the calories throughout the day so every two to three hours I would recommend you do that see how you go with it 
obviously don't get focused upon the weight side of things, like don't be weighing yourself to make sure that it's working, just keep doing that. I would say weigh yourself maybe once or twice, maybe once a week, just to see that you're getting, that it's actually working, and do that and see how you go from there. But I hope that helps and I hope that's been informative in some way, Susan. Much love to you. The next one is from Kira Asha. Much love, Kira. I hope you're doing well. I think she's got a YouTube channel. I'll check that out and I'll link it down below. I do believe she did have a YouTube channel. I don't know if she stopped it, but I'll link that down below. Kira is absolutely amazing. She says, if you could travel anywhere, where would you travel? Bucket list destination. <laughs> Bucket list, yeah. <laughs> we don't want to go there yet. But yeah, for me, I've always wanted to visit different places in Canada. Yeah, I, I would really like Canada. Like I say, it's very much like the climate of Scotland. For me, I would probably like to visit Israel, basically because I'm a Christian. I would love to visit the Great Wall and things like that. That's something I've always wanted to do, so that would be my first on my list is Israel. Secondly, I would like to visit the USA. I've always wanted to visit something like uh, Texas or obviously Las Vegas. That would be my big two, so yeah, they, they would be my two. Israel and Las Vegas and New York and obviously California. That would be my three top, my top three. Fudgy Boy agrees with me here as you can see. <laughs> Thanks very much, Kira. That was really, really appreciated. Great question. The next one is from my dear friend, Karen Jane. She's an amazing, amazing person. Please go and check out her YouTube channel. I'll actually link that down below. She talks a lot about a lot of things from a spiritual perspective. If I can get that word out. She obviously does a lot of zero waste and much, much more. She's absolutely amazing, guys. Please go and check her out. She asks a great question, what did you learn from your time in the vegan YouTube community? I reflect on this question a lot myself. Yeah, I do an awful lot of reflection on that, Can One thing I would say, what it's reflected, I've reflected a lot on, and it's gave me a perspective to be a better person, because I feel that it, when you leave the vegan YouTube community, you treat it as this apostate. It's worse than been when you leave a religion. I've obviously been in things like the Orange Lodge, which is the Orange Order. I've obviously been in things like the Mormons. They didn't treat me the same way as the vegan community did when I left it. It's absolutely disgusting, like I say. And when I look back at myself, I always consider myself to be a respectful person and not to hate upon people. But when I look back in some of the videos that i done when I was actually vegan, I absolutely cringe because the way I come across to people, I just thought, God, is that is that really, really you? It was like, I didn't think I was a bad person, but the way I come across, I basically judged a lot, a lot of people. And for that, I want to say sorry to everybody that I may have hurt, because what it's gave me a perspective on is that there's no one-size-fits-all diet. I think when it comes down to it, obviously we know veganism is not a diet, but to be vegan, you've got to follow a plant-based diet. And what I would say is that it's about doing your best. Like I say, there's no one-size-fits-all diet out there. And nutritional science is very, very bad in the respect that they don't really focus up upon a lot apart from epidemiology. And obviously we know correlation and causation should be what we should actually be looking at. But yeah, I think what it's given me a perspective on is to be a better person and to understand that everybody's going through their own journey and what works for you doesn't work for another person and everybody's trying to do their best. And let's like say, we're all good people and we shouldn't define ourselves by a dietary approach. Like I say, do what works for you and whatever that is, is your best approach. Like I say, I don't think we should obviously hate on anybody and that's what I think the vegan community focuses upon. It focuses a lot on supposed compassion, but it only gives that compassion to the animals. We've got to realise we're animals as well and that compassion obviously should start with yourself because you can't love and be compassionate to anybody else if you don't have that to yourself. So I think it's gave me a good real reflection on being a better person daily and implementing that and trying to live by that because it's walking the walk and talking the talk as the same goes and I think that's really really important. So. Thanks very much for that, Karen. If you would like to ask anything else, anybody, please let me know down in the comments below. Much love to you. Alvia Crescens, Starseed, absolutely amazing person. Please go and check out her channel. She does an awful lot of astrology and things like that. Great, great person. Loves you so much. 
she always talks about the piggies. She's asking me, how is Penny doing? Penny's doing absolutely amazing. For anybody that hasn't seen her on this channel, Penny is my s s eight month now, I was going to say six month there, eight month old Labrador pup. She's absolutely doing great. She <laughs> been obviously going to training classes and things like that she's coming on really really well she's be she's the only thing I would say is she backs a lot around food but that's coming along really really well obviously she's a Labrador she loves her food so what can we say about that is that's just natural but yeah she's really really doing really really well thanks very much that really great question love her so so much as I do with all the dogs and th that's my family that is we're babies so thanks very much my friend I appreciate that the next one is from N. Guelda, who's actually is my dear friend Gwen Estes. Thanks very much, Gwen. I hope you're doing well and much love to your family. She's asking me, am I too late to ask, do you have any ideas for dealing with compulsive eating? I don't know what the problem is, but probably just habit. But I've talked a lot to my sisters and we actually all have a fear of not eating enough food. We think it's due to the food rationing we had when we were growing up. Understandable. We never missed a meal, but many times meals were very, very sparse. I read a book one time about a person who survived a concentration camp, having experienced starvation, later they ate absolutely compulsively for the rest of their life. We certainly didn't experience this starvation, but I find it curious that what they experience seems to be have visited us as a fear of not having enough food. Do you have any ideas on this? Yeah, obviously I would say compulsive eating. What you've actually got to do with that is you've got to try and work out distraction techniques if that is obviously compulsive eating. I don't know what you mean by that. Is it is it binge eating or is it compulsive eating? If it's obviously binge eating, then you're obviously binging. I would say it's about finding distraction techniques. So doing something that you enjoy to obviously take your mind off the behaviour, obviously compulsive eating. But what I would say if it's compulsive eating it's starvation, what you, there's maybe something in your life that's obviously triggered that. So probably speak to a therapist or a, a hypnotherapist that I think they're really, really good resources to go to. They could obviously unlock what's actually caused that. But if it's obviously binging, I would say just find something that distracts you from the behaviour. That's something they do a lot, use a lot in obviously eating disorder therapy centres. They obviously use distraction techniques, something like art, going for a walk. Obviously not over-exercising because if it's walking it can obviously become a compulsive thing as well. So it's, you've got to look at it as, a, as a, an OCD type thing. So it's something you've obviously trained your, your brain to obviously do. So what we've obviously got to do is we've obviously got to retrain the brain a good behaviour. So we know the brain is neuroplastic so we can obviously rewire the brain. So it's obviously letting your brain know that food isn't scarce, that we live in a society that we can go and get food and it's really available at supermarkets and things like that. So obviously having foods in your house that are obviously triggering Whatever it is, I don't know, is there a certain food that you find that you obviously go and eat? So maybe have them less in your house. That would be what I would say. So I hope that's been helpful, Gwen. I really, really appreciate that question. The next one is from Inspiring Angel, my dear friend Laura. She's absolutely amazing. Another recovery warrior as well. She's asked, what has helped you the most in your recovery journal and what are your hopes for the future? What has helped me the most in my recovery, I would say, is just knowing that I've got to help myself because at the end of the day, you can doesn't really matter how much help you get, you're the one that's got to put in the work. And I think that's something that we don't realise a lot in recovery. We just, we feel as if we want to recover, but when we're trying to actually get the help, we're not actually following through with it. So for me, it's a bit putting in the work and obviously realising that part of that is nourishing myself with the food but 
nutritional rehabilitation is the most important thing before you actually start to work on the behaviours and the issues that's obviously caused your eating disorder. So for me it was obviously grief. I had to obviously nutritionally rehabilitate before I could actually do the work on that. So that was a big, big step for me. And I think as well, it was giving up labels and things like that. I realised that the vegan label wasn't doing me any good. For some people it does work. For me it was causing me mental health issues. It obviously deteriorated my health. And it was really, really hard because I'm an animal lover. I wanted to do everything for the animals, but I just had to realise that for me, it just was hindering my recovery. And I think that was a big, big step in me actually moving forward. So what I would always say to people is, if you feel that you aren't moving forward, ask yourself why, and then if, make the changes that you actually need to make. What's my hopes for the future? Well, my hopes for the future are to do so, so much more in mental health advocacy. I'm obviously now a support worker with BEAT, the eating disorder charity in the UK, so I'm helping a lot of people online and things like that. I've actually became a community champion as well, which means that I can spread mental health awareness in my community and obviously do more work for fundraising and things like that. And I would like to work in mental health at some point. I'm obviously, now I'm working on eating disorder recovery coaching. That's a big, big step forward. So that's some of my hopes for the future. I would like to become, a, I'm obviously a nutritionist, I would say. So I would like to become obviously doing a lot of nutritional coaching, personal training coaching and things like that along with the eating disorder recovery and obviously working with people that's got eating disorders helping them with obviously exercise and making that a healthy behaviour and obviously implementing nutritional dietary guidelines that's going to help them in their recovery as well Laura so thanks very much for that, I really appreciate that the last question is from Kirsty Hi Tommy and hello from Bournemouth Dorset Hello from Scotland, Kirsty. Thanks very much for that question. My questions are, what did your family think of you being vegan? What did my family think of me being vegan? Well, my family was actually really, really supportive, actually. They supported me in everything they can, and they've, they've done that all their life. What I've found is my real, real friends and my family that obviously love me and for who I am supported me 100%, and that's always been the case. She's asking me, did you manage to convert any members of your family? No, I didn't convert any members of my family to veganism. I really hate that word convert because I feel it's something you've got to come to the realisation yourself, if it's for you, I don't think anybody can convert you. I think that comes across as a bit, you know what I mean, a bit cultish in some ways. That's what I always feel. I feel everybody's different and if you actually help people connect the dots, well, good enough. But it's obviously them that's got to come to realisation. I obviously helped a lot of people actually become vegan. I obviously done a lot of street advocacy and obviously online and a lot of people went vegan because of me in some way or other. Now I worry about that because obviously what happened with my own health. She actually said, she says, did veganism cause arguments and are you looking forward to a Christmas turkey this Christmas? <laughs> oh God. Did veganism cause a lot of arguments? Absolutely, especially online with obviously friends and things like that. Didn't it cause me to lose real friends in real life though? It did cause a lot of arguments, obviously. With family, yes, it caused a lot of arguments. They obviously thought I was kind of pushing things on them and I was coming across as a bit judgmental and preacherish and cultish and things like that. So yeah, it did cause a lot of arguments, but no, they never shunned me because of that. Am I looking forward to a turkey this year? Well, at the moment, I'm obviously eating eggs, fish, dairy cheese and obviously dairy yogurts. I haven't made that switch yet to obviously turkey. I don't know what will happen. My health's doing really, really well. I feel the best I've ever felt in years, physically and mentally. So I don't think I'll probably need turkey, but who knows what the future holds. Like I say, do what's best for you. And that's always my message to anybody out there listening to this video. Do what works for you. And I, I would say don't follow any specific dietary guidelines. Like I say, people obviously go from vegan to carnivore and extremes. That is the thing that I would say. Don't follow extremes. Do what works for you, whatever that may be. Do what's healthy, do what's physically and mentally healthy for you. So I hope that answers that question, Kirsty. 
Like I say, this has been absolutely amazing, guys. I want to do more of these Q&As. Ask me anything. I'm an open book about anything in my life at all. And remember, as always, binge on life, purge negativity, and starve guilty feelings. And obviously, I hope if you've managed to follow this whole video, thank you very much. And for subscribing. Have you subscribed yet? Down below. Have you subscribed? <laughs> <laughs> Speak to you all in the next one.